Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Starting now with Surah Al-Imran, verse 156. Uh, Rafi, we were discussing the battle of Ohad. Okay? So Allah says, O oh, you who have believed, do not be like those who disbelieved and said about their brothers when they traveled through the land or went out to fight. If they had been with us, they, they would not have died or they would not have been killed. So Allah makes them makes that a regret within their hearts and it is Allah who gives life and causes death and Allah is seeing of what you do. If you are killed in the cause of Allah or if you die, forgiveness from Allah and mercy is better than whatever you can accumulate in this world. And whatever and whether you die or are killed, unto Allah you will be gathered. Okay, Rafi Bilal, please explain these verses. Uh, basically saying what you told me in the previous lecture, you know that uh, don't blame the a decision that uh, that if we had stayed in Medina and fought, then these people would not have gained shahada. Right. Because uh, they were destined to gain shahada at that time <coughs> and at that period. Right. Uh, and uh, fighting for Allah, so uh, it was all destined. Mm -hmm. so, and most importantly, Allah says, if you are killed in the cause of Allah, all right, forgiveness from Allah. And mercy is better than whatever you might be able to accumulate. So in other words, if you say, well, if this person was still alive, he could have done so much in his business. He could have, uh, you know, gone back to his family, enjoyed his property, his wealth, his money, his fame. Allah saying, even if that if that was possible, it's not because your time of death has been decided. Right. But even if that was possible. Is it not better to die while while fighting in the cause of Allah and get forgiveness for all your sins? and get a ticket to Jannah as opposed to staying for a few more years uh, here on this earth and just accumulating wealth? Do people who got shaheed, uh, do they go straight to Jannah uh, <clears throat> or, or do they have a barzakh peer as well? I think you've asked this question before and I told you that there is a different schools of thought. Some say they go straight, some say they know they have a barzakh period and in that barzakh period they of course are enjoying and, they're, and they are being given a lot of sustenance but they will actually enter Jannah afterwards. Again, there's no way of knowing because nobody knows what exactly happens after death, right? So that's why <clears throat> we're not sure. But what we do know, what we do know is whether it is Barzakh or whether it is straight to Jannah, it's an awesome time that they're having. A time that we cannot even imagine because Allah takes very good care of His slaves who have embraced Shahadat, <clears throat> okay? And so um, then Allah says in verses 159 onwards, So by mercy from Allah, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, you were lenient with them. If you had been rude and harsh in heart, <clears throat> they would have disbanded from about you. So pardon them, ask forgiveness for them, consult them in the matter. And, what, and when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely upon him. If Allah should help you, no one can overcome you. <clears throat> but if he, if he should forsake you, who is there that can help you after him? And upon Allah, let the believers put their trust. <clears throat> right. So interestingly, what Allah is saying over here is that number one, this huge uh, problem has happened that you have faced defeat. And everyone is confused and everyone is down and, you know, they're, and they're very demoralized because not only have they faced defeat, but the Jews and the hypocrites are actually mocking them. <clears throat> they're making fun of them and they're saying, well, if only these people hadn't gone, then uh, the, these great Sahabas would actually be alive and so on and so forth, right? They're spending confusion. And Allah is saying that Muhammad, peace be upon him, during this time was very calm and lenient and polite with the Muslims and with everyone. So it's not like, you know, uh, the Muslims uh, came up to him once and said, okay, you know, oh, why did Allah allow this to happen? Why did we face defeat? <clears throat> There were so many Muslims who kept coming up to him and kept asking the same question. That's why Allah keeps sending verses to console them. Just like I told you the question, but why? Why did this happen? And not at one point did the Prophet get angry and scold them, you know, and say, okay, Allah has sent you so many verses. Why don't you get it? He was so lenient with them. And Allah says that it is by our mercy. In other words, yes, he's a prophet. Yes, he was a, a very loving man, but he was a human, right? So a person can kind of lose their temper. They can become impatient. <clears throat> they can sometimes show with their face 
that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting annoyed with your constant questions. But Allah said over here that it was because of our mercy, we put so much calmness in your hearts that you were not slightly even rude to them because if you were, Allah says, they would have disbanded from about you. <clears throat> left Islam. They would, have, they would have left Islam. Because even though many of them loved Islam at that time, it's only been three years. And in three years, so many problems have come. The entire Arabia is attacking you. You just had the, uh, the Battle of Badr. Yes, you were able to win it. But right after that, you have now this Battle of Uhud. <clears throat> Jews are against you. Hypocrites have formed who are secretly against you. Uh, the polytheists are still uh, planning against you. And after Uhud, I told you that, you know, when the Arab region found out that, oh, yes, the Muslims have been defeated, many uh, polytheist Arab tribes came up with these new strategies to further uh, weaken the Muslims. Do you remember what I said? Yeah. <clears throat> what? So they would basically ask Absalom to send, uh, send some people, you know, to teach yes. him Islam. Yes. And then uh, they, they would either keep them as a Slaves or they or would kill them. Right. Yeah. So the situation was getting worse. Right. And so what Allah is saying over here is that uh, even though their Iman initially was strong, when so much happens in such a short span of time, you start having doubts. You start thinking, well, maybe he is a prophet, but Islam isn't for me. This is too tough. You know, when I was an ignorant person, life was still a bit better. You get it? Mm -hmm. So Allah says, that's why I made you very calm. So Allah is saying, now pardon them. In other words, this is where Allah is saying, everyone has been forgiven. The archers, forgiven. Those who left you on the battlefield, forgiven. For everyone, Allah is saying, they have been forgiven. And Allah is telling the prophet, you as well, pardon them. And forgiveness, and there's forgiveness for them, and consult them in the matter. Now, this is very important. Imagine how much Allah loves his slaves. That he's telling the Prophet that, yes, okay, these people, they made a mistake. I have forgiven them. I want you to forgive them. And what that means is in the future, if you ever need to seek advice regarding war strategy or anything like this, don't say, okay, I, I don't want to ask this person because this is the archer who left us on the battlefield. This is the man who left me on the battlefield. Don't hold anything against them. Grudge. Clean slate. Yes, no grudge. Clean slate. Forget about it all. Treat everyone the same. So no archer should feel that, okay, these people are, the Muslims have not really forgiven me because they, they treat me in, in a weird way. They're biased against me. They look at me in, in a weird way. Allah say, no, I've forgiven them. So you also should be um, consulting them in the matter. And when you have decided upon something, then trust Allah. <clears throat> Indeed, Allah loves those who trust Him. Another very important message. Allah is saying, okay, who decided to have the battle at Uhud? Uh, the Sahabas gave the advice. Okay, nice. right. And then the <clears throat> so was it decided by God? Did God send Jibreel and, and, and did Jibreel tell the Prophet that it must be at Uhud? No. No, it was something that they decided amongst themselves, right? Now, what can sometimes happen is now Muslims might look back and say, you know what, um, we decided to have it at Ohad, maybe that was a bad idea. And what starts to happen is you start losing confidence in your, advice. In your own advice, in your own opinion, so that in the future if the Prophet calls you and again he, he asks you for your opinion, you get too scared because you think, well, uh, we did think of Ahad and Ahad uh, turned out to be a defeat and, you know, you, you start losing confidence. So Allah is saying, no, don't do that. Whatever happened was destined to happen. It was a great decision. You were winning. There was a mistake made by the archers. Okay, this would have happened it, it, even if it wasn't at Ahad, if it was somewhere else, this would have happened. Move on. Do not look back and start losing confidence in yourself. That's why Allah says, then decide again in the future. And whenever you have decided... Then, dis then put your trust in God. So make, consult uh, everyone else, um, have a proper decision that is made, and once it's made, do not look back, leave it to God. Can you see what beautiful lessons Allah is teaching in just a couple of verses? If you don't put, your sh put yourself in their shoes, you will not understand what Allah is saying over here. It'll just seem like, okay, it's a normal verse when you have decided, then trust God. Understand what message Allah was giving them and what message He's giving you. Right? And then Allah says, 
uh, if Allah decides to help you, no one can overcome you. And if Allah decides to forsake you, then there's no one in the world who can help you. So once you have decided, make sure you are not transgressing any of Allah's commands. Make sure you continuously abide in zikr. And if Allah is going to help you, then it doesn't matter what your decision is or what your plan is, that help is going to come. That is, what, uh, that is the iman that a believer should have. Okay? And if it is destined that you are going to lose, then even if the world wants to help you, you will end up losing. It's okay. Move on. Get it? Mm -hmm. Then in verses 161 onwards, Allah says, It is not attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully and whoever betrays, um, taking unlawfully, will come with what he took on the day of resurrection. Then will every soul be fully compensated for what it earned and they will not be wronged. So is one who pursues the pleasure of Allah like the one who brings upon himself the anger of Allah and whose refuge is hell? and wretched is the destination, they are varying degrees in the sight of Allah and Allah is seeing of what they do. Now in this verse there's a, um, a lot of a debate between two schools of thought as to what this means. It says it's not possible or not attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully and whatever he has taken um, he will bring that with him on the day of judgment. So what exactly is he oh, spoken about? Oh, basically you know that uh, what um, uh, when they say that he will bring that uh, with him, uh, to the day, basically the nation that he guided. No, um, uh, there's one um, sort of a narration that some people are saying, which is the fact that on one occasion, uh, possibly in the treasury which contains in Medina, the, you know, there's a treasury, it's like a storehouse, which contains all of mm -hmm. um, uh, the extra spoils of war. And that's basically there to be used to help other poor people and so on. So there's this one narration where there was a very important piece of item that was missing. And it was believed that maybe the prophet had taken it home. Right. And so then this, um, some people, uh, the hypocrites, especially, they raised some questions about the prophet. And therefore, this verse came where Allah is saying, well, it's not possible for any prophet to act unfaithfully. The prophet would not simply go and take something uh, for his family uh, just like that. Well, is there a proof? OK, no. So uh, the one which makes more sense because it is impossible for uh, not only is it impossible that this happened, but it's impossible that uh, someone even pointed a finger at the prophet. What another uh, narration which makes more sense and which is the one that is uh, more believable, more plausible, is that at the end of the battle of Badr, uh, remember Badr happened just one year ago. And I told you that the, at the end of the battle of Badr, the spoils of war were there. This was their first victory. And Allah uh, sent a verse, which we will see coming much later, that all the spoils of war will be distributed to the poor. Four fifths will go to the poor. One fifth goes to the prophet. Because as I told you, the prophet, he doesn't do a business. He doesn't do trade. That's his only means of feeding his own family. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's believed that some of the Muslims of weak Iman at that time, uh, especially when they came back to Medina, the hypocrites who found out that, okay, the spoils of war are all going to the poor and one fifth is going to the prophet. They m made this claim that maybe this was not a verse that came from Allah. This is something that the prophet is just doing in order to take, uh, take spoils of war for himself only, right? Because this is a perfect opportunity for the hypocrites to jump in and to spread doubt and confusion. Mm -hmm. So Allah sent a verse clearing the Prophet, saying that it's not possible for any Prophet to act unfaithfully, right? To take something for himself, which Allah has not said, or to say that, okay, there's so many spoils of war, let me take as much as I can for myself, right? Mo Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his basic living standard was so incredibly simple. It was just about fulfilling the basic needs to remain alive. He would not accumulate anything extra. Okay, if there was anything extra, he was always giving it away because he said, I'm a prophet. My job is to help other people and to spread the message of Islam. So Allah is saying, not just Muhammad, peace be upon him, but for any prophet, they do not act unfaithfully. And if a prophet were to take something, then he will bring that thing that he has taken unfaithfully and he will be standing in front of Allah for judgment. So in other words, Allah is saying, it's not that you know I'm giving a free ticket to my prophets, 
the prophets have the greatest accountability because they are prophets. Right? Mm. So Allah was explaining to the Muslims of weak iman, don't fall for what the, the, the hypocrites are saying. Don't let that doubt enter your mind. It's just not possible. Okay, and so and also Allah is saying, do not compare a person like Muhammad, peace be upon him, who has earned the pleasure of Allah, uh, and compare him to someone who has earned the anger of Allah. Like someone who steals, who takes things which is not theirs, who becomes greedy, or who uh, who lies about verses of God, that is someone who is destined for Jahannam, right? That is someone Allah is very angry with. Don't even compare someone as amazing as a prophet to someone like this, okay? So a hypocrite could behave like this, but not someone as amazing as your leader, okay? So Allah says they are varying degrees in the sight of Allah and Allah is seeing of whatever they do. So there are people with strong iman, weaker iman, hypocrites, Jews, Allah saying, I'm watching all of it, and I know exactly what's happening. Then verses 164 onwards, Allah says, Certainly did Allah confer a great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book in wisdom, although they had been before in manifest error. So in other words, don't forget this huge blessing that you have been given. I have sent you a prophet, never sent before to the Arabs. Right? So don't keep thinking about the loss that you faced at Ohad. Why is it that when a single disaster, now you explain this, why is it that when uh, a single disaster struck you, although you had struck with one twice as great, you said, from where is this happening? Say, it's from yourselves. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. He's basically saying in this verse is that, um, oh, 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 can you read it again? <laughs> because because I, I understood it. Oh, this is why is it that, that when copy. why is it that when a single disaster struck you, mm-hmm. although you had struck one, uh, which was twice as uh, great. Okay, yeah. So basically, uh, when uh, you lost at the barrel of at the barrel the barrel of Ohad, when you lost there. Why have you suddenly gone into a depression? Although you won at Baron of Badr, which was even more, which, which was, was twice as difficult, which was twice as great, and Allah saying at that time, and then when you faced this defeat at Ohad, you said, "From where is this? Like, how has this happened?" You know, so we are Muslims. We are following the Prophet. Why did Allah allow this to happen? Because you and Allah saying, "Well, hold on. You, you, you have you forgotten that great victory?" And Allah saying, "Say it is from yourselves." Because you were winning. You, you did winning. this. Yeah, I did help you. You were winning, right? You were able to strike terror in the hearts of the enemy. The enemy was running, mm-hmm. and you can see the same message keeps coming back. Because Muslims, even at that time, just like us, they were humans. And they kept saying, but why? But how? But where was God? You get it? Mm -hmm. And so Allah keeps repeating it. And so Allah says, and what struck you on the day that the two armies met was by the permission of Allah that he might make evident the true believers. So Allah saying, yes, it happened with my consent. That does not mean Allah saying, I wanted this to happen. I wanted you guys to face defeat. But it happened with the izin of Allah. In other words, Allah saying, when you decide to do something bad, I am going to allow that thing to happen because it's your choice, right? When you face the consequences of it, that's when you will learn. If Allah stops you before you make a bad choice, how will you ever learn from your mistakes, right? So Allah is saying, yes, it happened. It happened with my izin. I permitted it to happen. I didn't want it to happen. This was your choice. And so Allah is saying that, and ultimately, I allowed it to happen because you will learn from your mistakes. You will, it will expose your iman so you can work on it. And then Allah says in verses 167 onwards, and that he might make evident those who are, are hypocrites. For it was said to them, come, fight in the way of Allah, or at least defend. And they said, if we had known that there would be fighting, we would have followed you. They were nearer to disbelief that day than to Iman, saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts, and Allah's most knowing of what they conceal. So Allah saying that, that everything that ha- had happened at Ohad 
was beneficial because it exposed the iman of the believers. Those who had weak iman saw their weak iman, so they know they have to improve. But it also exposed the hypocrites. <clears throat> so not only does, did it expose, remember Abdullah ibn Ubay and 300 people who turned back, but there were many hypocrites in Medina. When the Muslims were, uh, were leaving in the morning to go to Ohad, they told the Muslims, uh, they, they told everyone in Medina that we have to go for war. And some of the Muslims said, oh, well, you know, um, they made excuses that we're not feeling well, we're sick, we're this, we're that, and they didn't go. So now when the Muslims have come back defeated, Allah is saying that through this, I, I have exposed to you the hypocrites. Because when, they, when the Muslims came back and asked them, why didn't you guys come with us? Why were you not there fighting to help us at, in spreading Islam? They said, listen, if we honestly thought that a fight was going to happen, we would have come. So we, we didn't think that anything would happen. We didn't think Abu Sufyan would actually turn up. We didn't actually think that there would be any war because you just gave them a defeat at Badr. I mean, if we knew, I swear to God, I would have been there. And Allah is saying, I did this to expose that what they're saying with their mouths is not what is in their hearts. Here's the interesting part in this verse. Allah says, on that day when the hypocrites were saying this to you, they were closer to disbelief than to Iman. Mm -hmm. What this shows you is that there's a spectrum. On one extreme, you have excellent Iman. On one extreme, the other extreme, you have the, um, the greatest amount of Kufr. It's like the extreme of Kufr. Okay? This is a spectrum with two ends. One end is extreme Kufr, one end is extreme Iman. A hypocrite like this is somewhere in the middle. So on some days, he moves towards Kufr. He does things which are very wrong. And he knows it. But then on some days, he feels bad about himself. And then he moves towards Iman. He does good things. And then again, he moves towards Kufr. And then again, he moves towards Iman. He goes back and forth and back and forth. Right? Mm -hmm. And Allah is calling them uh, 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 people who are hypocrites because they know exactly what Allah wants from them. Okay? But they are hiding it. So they, instead of making a decision that I need to walk on the path of Islam, my heart has testified, I know this is the truth. They keep oscillating back and forth and back and forth. And they always lie. So they're never honest about it. And this is what Allah is saying, that on that day, when they made this statement, they were closer to kufr than to iman, because they were lying. They made a huge lie. They said, I swear we were planning on going. You get it? So when you oscillate back and forth and then you start lying about it to hide the fact that you were too scared to do jihad, that is when you have entered towards hypocrisy and Allah saying that now you're closer to disbelief than Iman. Allah was exposing them. If they were honest, if they said, okay, Prophet, I, I'm so sorry, I got scared and, and this and that, Allah would not have called them people who are munafiks. Allah would have said, okay, these people have weak Iman, they really have to work on their Iman. They cannot do this again. Right? But when it comes to the hypocrites, Allah is saying, look, this is Allah exposing the hypocrites. He lied. So Allah is exposing the hypocrites to the Prophet, but He's exposing the hypocrites to themselves. He's saying that, check the way you just behaved. You just lied. You are now a hypocrite. So change your behavior. Stop doing it right now. You still have time. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. um, then Allah says, um, those who said about their brothers while sitting at home, if they had obeyed us, they would not have been killed. Say, prevent death from yourselves if you should be truthful. So if you honestly think that they could have still been alive, then when death comes to you, see if you can escape it. When the angel of death comes knocking at your door, see if you can find a place to run and hide. And so Allah says, And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive with Allah and they are receiving their provisions. Okay. So, so, so does that mean again, no, no. Again, the... right. But again, even when you are in the barzakh period, your ruh, your soul is still alive over there. We have hadith that tell you that a person who is righteous, he has the doors of jannah open, right? He is enjoying his his time over there. And the person who was was not righteous, he has the doors of jahannam open. Yes, he is suffering from that in too. The ayat it says that they are receiving provision, right? They're with Allah. They are with Allah is a metaphor. Again, this could mean they are actually in Jannah or this could mean that they are 
close to God in the sense that once you die and if you are a righteous person, you have gone back to God, right? You have gone back to Allah. But have you entered into uh, actual Jannah? That we cannot say. Has the doors of Jannah opened for you? That we cannot say. Because some people say, well, that only happens when the day of judgment starts. So that's why there is a bit of confusion. But regardless of whether they have entered or not, what's important is they're having a brilliant time. Because Allah mm. is incredibly happy with them. And um, so then Allah says over here, and this is a very important part. There was uh, this hadith that I want to mention here, where Hazrat Usman reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, truly the grave is the first stage of the hereafter. So before you get into uh, Jannah or Jahannam, the first stage is the grave. And, uh, and he says, uh, the Prophet said, whoever is saved from it, Whatever comes after it will be easy for him. And if he's not safe from it, whatever comes after it will be harder for him. I have never seen anything more frightening than the grave. That is why we as Muslims keep saying, don't fear death, prepare for death. Because it's coming and you cannot stop it and you have no idea when it's coming. But when it comes and you're in the grave, it's either going to be victory for you, which means if... Everything is good in, in the Barzakh period. Everything after that is great. But if you find out that the Barzakh period is not good, then, every, then what's coming after that is a million times worse. Right? So you've got to keep thinking about that. Then verses 170 onwards, Allah says, Rejoicing, again, this is a continuation of those who have been shaheed, where Allah says they are alive with their Lord receiving provision. Here Allah says, they are rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of his bounty. They receive good tidings about those after them who have not yet joined them, that there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. They receive good tidings of favors from Allah and the bounty and, and of the fact that Allah does not allow the reward of the believers to be lost. And this, by the way, the fact that it says over here, they receive good tidings about those after them who have not yet joined them from this um you know we also have uh, this information which comes in the hadith that those who pass away um what happens is that you know when a new person passes away and he's also shaheed and he joins them then those who passed away before ask the new person who's just joined them and they ask him about information that how is this person doing who's there uh, you know on earth they especially mention uh, those particular people that I still I still do remember them. So uh, what exactly is their state? How are they doing these days? Right? They inquired about them. And then the, the latest person who's passed away and who has joined the company of the righteous in the Barzakh period, which again shows that in the Barzakh period, you get to actually be with those who are also righteous. So it's not a time when you are just alone. If you are those who are who are righteous, not only do you have the doors of Jannah open, but you also get to reunite with the others who are righteous. So it's you're not in isolation. And so then Allah says they receive good tidings about those after them who have not yet joined them. So the other great sahabas who have yet to become shaheed and who have yet to join the company of the righteous, they get you they get to get information about them and how they're doing and so on. And that, again, it just shows to them, Allah is explaining this to the Muslims to let them know those who have been shaheed, don't cry over them. Yes, you miss them. That's fine. That's normal. But don't cry over them because they, have, they are receiving bounties, provisions, and they are in great righteous company. Okay. Um, and so then Allah says in 172 onwards, those believers who responded to Allah and the messenger... After injury had struck them, for those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward, men said to them, a great army is, is coming against you and frightened them, but it only increased their faith. And they said, Hasbun Allahu wa ni'mal vakil. For us, Allah suffices and he is the best disposer of affairs. Yes, Rafi, you are grinning. What does this mean? I don't know. What? I don't remember. Okay, um, the Battle of Ohad has happened. They faced a defeat. They came back very demoralized. What happened the very, very next day? Mm -hmm. 
the very very next day the very next day so a lot of them are still injured demoralized feeling down very sad missing the sahabas who have embraced shahadat uh, jews making fun of them hypocrites making fun of them the very next day in the morning what command comes to them from the prophet peace be upon him no idea that, 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 that brilliant really big, uh, really big no no issue. what happened was abu sufyan took the army of Quraysh. And he went back, right? Now, at that time, by the way, when the Muslims had gone up the Mount Ohad and it was clear that they are defeated and victory is with the people of Quraysh, a lot of the people at that time told Abu Sufyan that, you know, instead of turning back and just going away, let's chase them up the Mount Ohad and let's just completely kill them. Let's annihilate the Muslims. This is the perfect opportunity. And Abu Sufyan turned back and said, no, we have won. This is what we wanted. And that's enough. So he took, he took his army and, and he went. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, was given this message from God. And the Prophet started to think, what if Abu Sufyan turns around and comes back to Medina? Because, the, because they will think, we gave the Muslims a huge defeat. They are demoralized right now. This is the perfect time for us to enter Medina and completely destroy them. We can attack them and we can ext- extinguish Islam forever. So... The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the next day he woke up in the morning, he told all the people who had just fought at Ohad one day before that pick up your weapons, we will go and chase Abu Sufyan. And every single one of them said, No, they said yes. They said yes. So they all picked up their weapons and they all went. They were injured, demoralized, sad, grieving, but they picked up their arms and they went. And they went with as much passion, knowing that we might be entering into another battle. And we are already are feeling very low and very down. But did, did they say, oh, no, I'm sorry, Prophet, we need some time to recover. I'm sorry, Prophet, I'm very depressed right now. I'm sorry, I just don't feel like fighting. Did they? No. They got up with as much passion. They forgot their defeat. They forgot everything. And they completely abided by the Prophet's commands and they went marching. Now what happened was Abu Sufyan did actually turn around and he did start thinking, yeah, this is a perfect opportunity. Let's enter it into Medina and annihilate them once and for all. Right? The Jews are in Medina. The Jews are on our side in any case. So we can go and give them a complete defeat. And let's end this entire talk of Islam and this Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Right? Now, what happened was, as uh, the Muslim army is moving in, in one direction, and Abu Sufyan is turned around and he's moving in the opposite direction, the Prophet, peace be upon him, after a while, they stopped um, approximately eight miles from Medina. And when they stopped there, there was an, another man who was taking his caravan, and he was moving in the same direction as the Muslims. But of course, the Muslims have, had, uh, they have an army that is moving, so they move slowly. And this man has just a caravan, so he's moving very quickly. And so the man, he comes and he um, spends time with the Prophet and he talks to him about Ohad and, you know, we heard about what happened and so on. And it's believed in some narrations that are there on the spot he embraces Islam. And so the Prophet tells him, okay, you're moving in this direction. As you go further, you will meet Abu Sufyan's army. When you meet him, tell Abu Sufyan that there is a huge Muslim army that is coming after you. So this will put terror in his heart. Said so these people, I just defeated them yesterday. And they're up and they're, they're absolutely ready to fight again. You know, it will put terror in his heart. So he said, okay. So the man went forward and as he went, um, he met uh, Abu Sufyan and he gave them the message. Now, as he met Abu Sufyan, then Abu Sufyan found another man with a caravan going in, in the opposite direction towards the Muslims. So he said, you go and you will meet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So you tell him that there is a great uh, army of Quraysh that is coming after you. So it'll put terror in his heart. So he said, okay, fine. So that man came with his caravan, met the Prophet, and he said, a great army is gathering against you. And Allah's quoting this. And Allah said, men said to them, a great army is gathering against you and try to frighten them. But it only increased their iman. And the Muslims said, hasbun Allah wa ni'mal vakeel. That it is in Allah that we put our trust. So if there is this great army coming, then absolutely fine. It does not scare us. We are ready for anything and everything because we have put our trust in God. 
and he will decide for us. And on the other hand, when Abu Sufyan got the message, it put so much terror in his heart, he turned back and they went all the way back to Mecca. So there was no encounter, there was no battle, there was no fight. The Muslims simply came back and they came back victorious. Why were they victorious? Because they did not, uh, you know, uh, Abu Sufyan did not come to. Yeah, so how does that make them victorious? Because he was initially coming to. But how does it make them victorious? In the sense that uh, the people with weak imams, imams is not strong. In the sense that they have earned Allah's pleasure. Allah was incredibly happy with them. This is what he says in 174 onwards. Allah says, So they returned with favors from Allah and his bounty. No harm touched them and they pursued the pleasure of Allah. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty. So at that moment, Allah became a rahim for them. He selected them for a special mercy. So the same people who one day ago made a huge mistake and Allah said, okay, I've forgiven them. Not only have they been forgiven, but they have been selected for Allah's special mercy. Allah is so happy with them. You get it? That's how, and, and what do we have to learn from this? When you make a mistake, don't just spend the, the rest of your life in depression. Get up and do jihad and do something that will earn you the pleasure of Allah. So that Allah will not only forgive, but he will give you extra ajr and rewards. And so then Allah says, um, that is only Satan who frightens you of his supporters. So fear them not, fear me, if you are indeed believers. So Shaitan whispers and says, you're going for Abu Sufyan? Are you feeling okay? I mean, they, they just defeated you. And they will give you another defeat. You're dead this time. You already are injured and demoralized. And Allah says that's what he wants to do, put fear in you, don't fear anyone but me. And then verse 176 onwards it says, And do not be grieved, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, by those who hasten into disbelief. Indeed, they will never harm Allah at all. Allah intends that he should give them no share in the Akhirah and for them is a great punishment. Indeed, those who purchase disbelief for belief, never will they harm Allah at all and for them is a painful punishment. And let not those who disbelieve ever think that because we extend their time of enjoyment, it is good for them. We only extend it so that they may increase in sin and for them is a humiliating punishment. G. Rafi Bilal, can you please explain this? No. There's too many things. There are too many things. So Allah is telling the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you see so many of the hypocrites uh, chasing towards disbelief. You see so many of the polytheist Arabs running towards disbelief. You see so many people not even bothering to even listen to your message and pay attention. So many people terrified of jihad. And Allah is saying, don't think that they can harm God. Your message will spread. Islam will never be extinguished. Allah cannot be harmed. So don't let it grieve you. You know, has it ever been that sometimes you talk to someone and you're really trying to convince them and you know what's right and you get so angry that why does this person not understand? It's so simple. Why doesn't he see it? And so Allah is telling the Prophet and the Muslims that those who run towards kufr and they run towards things that are haram, don't grieve over it. They cannot harm Allah and it's a choice that they're making. Allah will still give them opportunities, but it's a choice that they're making. Let them make that choice and at the end, they will have a painful punishment. And most importantly, Allah is saying, let not those who disbelieve think that just because they are having wealth and fame and money and gold, that this is good for them. Allah is saying, I'm only giving this to you so you can... So uh, your sins can be increased. You can indulge more in dunya. I'm extending you rope. rope. Does this happen to us? Do we sometimes say, oh, you know, my life is so difficult. Look at that person. He doesn't even do his prayers and look, he just got a promotion. Look at how happy he is. Look at how the fact that he gets, you know, so much, he does brilliant in everything and he doesn't even pray to God. He doesn't even believe in Allah. He doesn't even fast. Yet Allah has given him so much. How come his life is so easy and my life is so difficult? Yes. So Allah is saying, when you see people like this, don't think that I'm happy with them or that these people are truly successful. No, I'm just giving them extra enjoyment. 
And what this also teaches you is that if you have a prolonged period of happiness and enjoyment, be careful. Because what could what could that be an indication of? That Allah is giving you rope. That Allah is not exactly happy with you. If you have a prolonged period of no test, no hardship, nothing, maybe Allah has forsaken you and he has earmarked you for a painful punishment. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful lesson. Tests are not something that you should grieve and say, oh, Allah hates me, he tested me. It actually shows you that Allah loves you. He's not granting you rope. Then verse 179, it says, Allah will not leave the believers in that state that you are in until he separates the evil from the good. Nor would Allah reveal to you the unseen, but instead Allah chooses of his messengers whom he wills. So believe in Allah and his messengers. And if you believe and fear him, then for you is going to be a great reward. So in other words, again, for this test at Uhud and for every other test, Allah says, by doing it, I'm separating those who are righteous from those who are hypocrites. I have to expose and show you who are the munafik, who are the dangerous people, who are those who don't love you and who don't like you. Because only when I separate them, you as Muslims will know that these are people I cannot trust. Okay? Because when things are going good, everyone looks normal. Everyone looks the same. But when there's a jihad, a tough, difficult time, that's when you know who are the truly righteous and who are those who are just running away. So now the Muslims are being told, if you have to seek advice, go to the Prophet. If the Prophet is not available, go to the Sahabas. Go to all the amazing people who always abide by Allah's commands. Don't go to those who left you. Because there clearly is a problem with their iman. They're not sincere. And most importantly, Allah says, that um, nor would Allah reveal to you the unseen, but Allah chooses of his messengers whom he wills. So Allah is saying, I know what's in their hearts. I know who the munafiks are. I know those who are truly, truly against you and who are very dangerous. But Allah is not going to reveal. Allah is saying that's, uh, that's part of the unseen. That is information I will only reveal to those of the prophets or to those messengers or to those selected people whom I wish. And what we know is that later on you'll see at the time of Tabuk, a very long and arduous expedition, when the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him was coming back, there were approximately 12 hypocrites who uh, launched an attack on him and they tried to kill him. Right? But, um, but of course they were not able to, they were not successful. And at that point the Prophet gave a list of those 12 names to a Sahaba whose name was Hosefa. And he gave that list and he told him that keep this list, do not share this information, do not share these names with anyone, I'm only sharing this with you. And this is an example of how Allah is saying that I know who the hypocrites are, but I only share that hidden information of what is in their hearts with people whom I select. So he selected his prophet and he told his prophet, but he doesn't share it outright with everyone, that these are the hypocrites. And this information was kept with Hazrat Huzaifa to the extent that after the prophet's demise, Hazrat Umar went up to Hazrat Huzaifa and asked him, that, tell me, is my name on that list? Can you imagine? And that shows you that Allah is saying that a proper Muslim is a vigilant Muslim who knows that hypocrisy can enter my heart at any time, I have to keep a check on myself. The, the point of the list is not so that you can find out, oh, I wonder who's on the list. You know, I, I wonder who's going to Jahannam. I wonder who, you know, who Allah's angry with. That's the first thing we do, right? We want to know, oh, it's definitely not me, but I want to know who's on it. But what a good Muslim does is it says, am I on it? Have I become a hypocrite? Am I behaving like someone who, who Allah is angry with? That's the point. And that's what you see happening with great, uh, an amazing Sahaba like Hazrat Umar. Then in verses 180 onwards it says, And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty, ever think that it is good for them, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled, with what they withheld on the day of resurrection. So the money, the gold that they don't like to spend in charity, Allah is saying, I'll tie it around your neck on the day of judgment. And to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. Allah with, Allah, with what you do is fully acquainted. Allah has certainly heard the statement of those who said, 
Indeed, Allah is poor while we are rich. We will, we will record what they are saying and their killing of the prophets without right and will say, taste the punishment of the burning fire. That is for what your hands have put forth because Allah is not ever unjust to his servants. So, you know, there's so many verses where the Muslims were constantly told, give out in charity, give out in charity. You have to strengthen the ummah, you have to strengthen the army, you have to spend on the army, you have to help the poor. And so the Jews made this claim, it seems like your God is very poor. Yeah, he just keeps asking for money. And it was a way for them to mock the verses. And Allah is saying, I've recorded it. I've recorded their statement that they are saying, your God, Allah is poor. And Allah is saying that I w I've recorded it and I will hold them to, to account for what they've said and for their killing of prophets as well. And they will be put into Jahannam. Now, the interesting thing is when you read the Old Testament, there are hundreds of verses that are saying the same thing. Give out charity, give out charity, because it's the same message coming from the same God. But the Jews would say, no, your God seems to be asking for charity so much. And in fact, do you know our zakat is how much? Um, a 7.5. Wow. 2.5. 2.5% of Our the zakat world. is 2.5% of the wealth that you have. Do you know what is the, the zakat that was ordered by God that for the Jews? 10%. I was going to say 10%. I'm sure you were. I, I was. It was 10%. So <laughs> the same Jews... Who's, uh, in which the Old Testament for them is telling them give 10% of zakat and who are being told so many times to give out in charity, they have the audacity of making fun of the Muslims and saying your God seems to be asking for a lot of money, your God seems to be poor. Well, isn't the same God, didn't he ask you guys for 10%? You get it? Yeah, but this was their way of creating doubt amongst the hypocrites that this man is not a prophet. Amongst the hypocrites? Amongst the hypocrites and the people of low Iman, right? <clears throat> that this man is not a prophet. Because remember the Jews and hypocrites had become a party together. Mm -hmm. So they would use this to make fun that he, he isn't a prophet. He's, this isn't a message from God because their God seems to always be asking for money. While they were hiding that, well, guess what? Our God asked for the same amount. In fact, he asked for more. Because Allah doesn't need it, but he's using this to help you get into Jannah. So Allah says, they are those who said, indeed, Allah has taken our promise. Indeed, Allah has taken a promise from us not to believe in any messenger until he brings us an offering which fire from the heaven will consume. Say, there have already come to you messengers before me with clear proofs and even that of what you speak. So then why did you kill them if you're truthful? Then if they deny you, Muhammad, peace be upon him, so were messengers denied before you who brought clear proofs and written ordinances and the enlightening scripture. What a brilliant reply from God. So the Jews came up with this new narrative that, listen, in our Torah, it says that don't believe in any messenger until um, he can show you a, a huge miracle. And the miracle they were asking for was that if you sacrifice uh, an animal, the animal should be sacrificed by a fire that comes from the sky, it comes down, burns the flesh, and it goes back up again. Oh, uh, you told me about that. Right. So this is one of this is um, one of the signs that they asked for, and they said, "Well, since your man, this Arab Muhammad peace be upon him, since he cannot do it, our Torah tells us not to believe in him." Now, can the Muslims possibly respond to this? No. No. So guess who's responding? Allah. Allah. And guess what Allah just said? He says. You know, it's like, it's like, imagine Allah tells the Muslims, okay, guys, move back. Let me answer these, the, let me answer the Jews. I've got this. And so Allah says, tell them, they were messengers who asked for exactly, who showed you this exactly same sign, the exact one. So then how come you kill them? Now, when you open the Old Testament, now, of course, the Jews were, were confounded. Okay, how did, how did this man know? When you open the Old Testament, you find that at one point, Prophet Elijah was sent. Okay? And he was sent to a king who was a Jew. And this was, in other words, he was sent to Bani Israel. And there was a king who was a Jew, and he started to worship this god called Baal. They made this huge uh, uh, idol. 
and he started worshipping and because he was the king he told all of his people all the Jews that you have to worship this god Baal so you can worship Allah but you have to worship Baal as well and then there were these priests who were called the priests of Baal okay and the king said these are actually prophets they're prophets who have been sent by this god Baal and you know so on and so forth so they really were into a polytheism so Allah sent prophet Elijah and prophet Elijah went and he told uh, the priests of Baal that okay I'm going to get in uh, how about we have a challenge and they said okay and he says okay the challenge is whichever one of us can show uh, can um show an offering of an animal that is consumed by fire that comes from the sky that is the uh, that person is a true prophet and he should be followed so the prophet of Baal said okay yeah so all of them sat together they started to pray to Baal and they said okay Baal you know we're going to give an offering please show us fire from the sky that consumes this and so on and prophet Elijah was praying to God too and then it was the day of the challenge so they both they both brought their offering and then they both prayed to God and of course this fire came down from the skies and it burned the offering of prophet Elijah the exact miracle that the Jews are now asking Muhammad peace be upon him to do and after it was done prophet Elijah said see now this proves that I'm a prophet follow me so destroy Baal and destroy all these prophets of Baal and the king said okay let's capture Elijah and kill him and so this is this is recorded in the old testament it's recorded in the torah so allah saying okay you're asking for that miracle i think i showed you a miracle like that before i think i showed it to one of your messengers and i think you guys reacted by trying to kill him by killing him right so how does this argument actually work do you get it no was a prophet elijah of a nabi or so uh he was a nabi but he was given a miracle so nabis can be shown miracles remember the difference was has nothing to do with miracles it has to do with the fact that one of them the rasul says obey me follow me my sunna my sharia my book everything right but does a nabi also get you know a message from god through a of nabi? course nabis <coughs> get messages from jibril alayhi salam as well that's how they are able to tell everyone the message of god that's how they're able to tell everyone that remember what the previous rasul taught you they they they're given all that information from jibril mm. right then verses 185 onwards allah says every soul will taste death and you will only be given your full compensation on the day of resurrection so he who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to jannah has attained uh his desire in other words the pleasure of allah and what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion so this dunya is just a delusion you know it's like when you're playing your games and you put on that those 3d glasses vr the vr yes thank you so it seems like it's it's virtually everything is real it's a virtual reality so everything just seems so real to you that you start chasing it and allah and allah says when death approaches you that those glasses are taken off and that's when you realize you were chasing just a, it was all a delusion it wasn't real mm-hmm. so allah says you will surely be tested in your possessions and in yourselves and you will surely hear from those who were given the scripture before you and from those who associate others with allah the polytheists much that will hurt you but if you are patient and fear allah indeed that is of the matters worthy of determination in other words the muslims are being told you will hear a lot of things from the jews and the the polytheists that will really hurt you there's a lot more coming so don't think that okay this was uh, this was it no more tests after this allah is saying no no there's there's a lot more coming i'm preparing you right now so oh this happened but there's a lot more coming that's going to hurt you that's going to make you feel bad it's not like okay after this there's no more tests and there's victory after victory after victory no there's going to be a lot more that hurts you and harms you oh why are the jews are still in medina because i thought you know it at, became that not not uh at this time the ummah has changed yes but that does not mean that initi- uh, all the jews immediately went away one tribe has already been uh, expelled right 
mm-hmm. because of the incident after the Battle of Badr. Mm-hmm. And another tribe is subsequently going to be expelled. Uh, Khan, uh, no, uh, about pro- about the Battle of Ohad. After the Battle of Ohad, another one is going to be expelled. And then a third one is going to be done much later. Yeah. So for now, um, what Allah is saying is that there's a lot more that is coming. But if you are patient and fear Allah, they cannot harm you. So the 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 warning is very important but allah is saying don't think now i'm telling you right now don't think life is going to be great now there was just this one test of ahad no it there's a lot more coming and uh, but allah is saying just be very calm and always fear god and everything will be fine then verses 187 onwards it says and mention mm-hmm. O Muhammad peace be upon him when Allah took a covenant from those who were given the scripture saying you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it but they threw it away behind their backs and exchanged it for a small price and wretched is that which they purchased the Jews and the Christians who were given the book they threw it behind their backs completely ignored it and never think that those who rejoice in what they have perpetrated and like to be praised for what they did not do Never think them to be in the safety from the punishment for them as a painful punishment. So they can get a lot of fame and wealth and, you know, stuff in this world, but don't think that, okay, Akhirah is great for them too. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and Allah is over all things competent. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for those of understanding. And remember Allah while standing, sitting, lying on their sides, give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this for no reason. Exalted are you, then protect us from the punishment of the fire. So Allah is saying those who are who will be able to attain the truth are those who think. You know, having blind faith in God is not easy. Having faith and conviction in a God you cannot see is not easy. So let's just start by looking around and asking questions. Ponder about the night and day, earth, rotation, universe, everything that you can see. And then say, Allah, you couldn't have made all of this for no reason. There has to be a reason that everything is designed so perfectly. You must have made us because you want something from us, right? Or was the reason that just, okay, enjoy your life and then just die and that's it? And the more you think, the more you'll understand why you were created. And so Allah says, "Our Lord." and furthermore, these people say, Our Lord, indeed, whoever you admit to the fire, you have disgraced him. And for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. Our Lord, indeed, we have heard a caller calling to faith, saying, Believe in your Lord, and we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us our sins, remove from us our misdeeds, and cause us to die with the righteous. Beautiful prayers that are now being given as this surah ends. Allah is telling the righteous believers, this is what you should say. And our Lord, grant us what you promised us through your messengers. Do not disgrace us, humiliate us on the day of judgment. Indeed, you do not fail in your promise. And their Lord responded to them. Now Allah's response comes after you've made all these amazing prayers. Never will I allow to be lost the work of any worker among you, whether male or female. You are of one another. So those who have migrated or who were evicted from their homes or who were harmed in my cause because of Islam or they were fought or they were killed fighting in my cause, I will remove from them all their misdeeds. So, clean slate. I will surely admit them to Jannah, beneath which rivers flow, as a reward from Allah, and Allah has with him the best reward. So, Allah is saying, you made all these beautiful prayers, now here is my response. You do any struggle for me, purely for me. You cannot say I'm doing this for Allah and for fame, wealth, dunya. Only for Allah. And Allah is saying, I promise you not a single thing will I uh, not compensate on the Day of Judgment. Everything will be compensated and you will be so happy that even insan at that time will say, okay, Allah, I did do things for you, but I didn't do that much. Allah is going to give so much in response to the tiny struggle even that you did that you will be incredibly pleased with Allah. And Allah says on that day, I will, I will be pleased with you, but even you will be pleased with me. Even you will say, Allah, you're awesome. You get it? And then Allah says, 
be not deceived by the uh, uninhibited movement of the disbelievers throughout the land. It is a small enjoyment. Their final refuge is hell. And wretched is the resting place. So let them enjoy, have fun, fame, wealth, all of that. Don't think that uh, Allah's on their side. But those who fear their Lord will have gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally as an accommodation from Allah. And that which is with Allah is best for the righteous. Indeed, among the people of the scripture are those who believe in Allah. So amongst the Jews and Christians, there are those who believe in Allah and what was revealed to you and what was revealed to them, they are submissive to Allah. They do not exchange the verses of Allah for a small price. Those will have their reward with Allah, indeed Allah swift in account. So those Jews and Christians who are loyal to their books and who subsequently believe in Allah and what was revealed to you, they believe in the Quran. They believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They enter into Islam. Allah saying all their past good deeds as well, they will be recorded. Remember I told you this for Jews and Christians? Because previously as well, they were only worshipping God. They were doing those good deeds for God. And so finally Allah says, O you who have believed, persevere, endure, remain stationed and fear Allah that you might be successful. And there's this beautiful example of um, a Jew, a rabbi whose name was Mukhairik. He was a rabbi and he embraced Islam and he would go around telling the Jews. He was a rabbi telling the Jews that I'm telling you that this man is saying the exact same things that are there in our books. I'm telling you that embrace Islam. And when it was the time for Ohad, he in fact told the Jews, come on, we have to help this man. We have to support him. Let's go. And many of the Jews said, oh, well, um, uh, this battle is happening and you know Sabbath is coming Saturday so we have to stay at home and we have to worship God so sorry and when he went for Ahad before he went he told the Jews that if I die I want you to t take all my property and give it to Muhammad peace be upon him and he embraced Shahadat at the battle of Ahad so take oh, it oh, was, was he the a person who they showed in uh, the Umar series no. Yes, yes. No. It's there in the Umar series as well, that rabbi, that Jew, who actually went and he was telling the other Jews that follow this man, he is the prophet. Did the Jews actually give the property to Allah or did they I, just say? I don't no. know. Don't know about that. But what we do know from this is that the surah is now finished. But at the end, in, at the end of Surah Baqarah, there were beautiful, the last two verses, remember, beautiful prayers in there. Allah's teaching us. Same prayers over here. Allah's saying, memorize these du'as. Because at times when, when we do du'a, we don't know how to do du'a. We don't know what are the beautiful words to say. So memorize these. It's a beautiful thing where you're saying to Allah, protect me from Jahannam. Please allow me to go in, into Jannah. Please don't make me face humiliation when I'm standing in front of you on the Day of Judgment. Please Allah, I've heard the person who's calling me to God, to God, Muhammad, peace be upon him. I believe in him. I believe in you. And please Allah, please let me die as being a righteous person. Okay? And um, so with this, Surah Al-Imran is finished. And inshallah, in the next lecture, we start with Surah Nisa. Assalamu alaikum.